I I came uh, onto this um, study or, or message sermon uh, with the intent of closing it out today. But you know what? I don't I don't think that's going to be possible. You know, so it's so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just finish it next week. But I'll do as much as I can this week. Uh, John has been been trying to get in there, but you know, there's always a lot of been delays for him. So I'm going to just ask him to give me another week. And hopefully he'll get everything settled. Uh, today he asked for prayer because his uh, his mom and and some of his uh, sisters and a niece I think had uh, a car broke down on the road and they didn't know what to do about it. So he drove over there to help them out, and so that's where he is today. But I'm going to try to see if I can finish this, this message about the doctrine and what is its purpose for. Uh, let me just say ahead of time that this um, doctrine that I started working on years ago, you know, off and on, uh, came directly from the Church of God website. In, in other words, the, the things that we believe. But as I, I started comparing what I'm presenting here uh, recently and today and to the next week, uh, I find that they don't really have the same uh, doctrinal beliefs as they did before. And I'll kind of point them out as, as I go, but I don't mean to criticize anyone. But nevertheless, I think um, the doctrine that we need to keep more of than any institution has to be the Bible, the Word of God. Because that never changes. Uh, a mankind can change the interpretation of it, but in the end, you 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 have to make a decision as to whether you're going to follow the word of God or what other people think and, and say. So <clears throat> it seems like a lot of the commandments have been replaced by traditions. Traditions of man's and look at what Christ said about that. In Mark 7, 7 to 8, and in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. And, and that's, and I'm seeing that more and more and more. Um, we're seeing a great falling away, not just outside the church, but inside the church as well. And I don't think I need to get into detail about that because I think you you're aware of it by now. Sabbath keepers are becoming Sunday keepers. And uh, whole churches have converted to sun Sunday church. Because the intent is to try to get as many people in the pews as possible. But you know what? If we get to the point that we continue to serve a, a mankind and to please mankind, we're going to be in a lot of trouble because the only one I need to please is the Lord, you know, my 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 Creator, and uh, and I'll I'll over, I, I will call out any traditions that are being out there, and 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 I think that a lot a lot of us have not realized the importance of it, but there are some. There are some uh, ordinances that the Church of God does still keep, and, and for that I'm, I'm glad to say, but um, Christ prescribed ordinances that confirm the faith in him. Now, this is not really a commandment, but it's an ordinance. So what is the difference there? The, the, the command is the command of God, and it cannot be altered or changed in anything anyway, and you may not be, you will not be saved by keeping them, but you will be lost if you don't. But an ordinance is pretty much, this is something that the Lord wants you to do, but it's, it, uh, it is not uh, li like uh, with the same power and effect as breaking a commandment if you don't. Uh, that's the best way I can say it. It's a little bit, um, you know, uh, vague there at times. So baptism is one preceded by confession of faith in Christ and repentance, symbolizing the believer's initial union with Christ by death to sins. 
So the burial and immersion in water and rising to a new life. And so that's how we become born again. But you know what? If you never got it right, if you just went through the motions because you didn't really know what you were doing or because it seemed like the nice thing to do, then uh, you, you, you might be having some problems in being born again. First Peter 3.21 says, and that water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you, not by the removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So again, unlike the, the commandments that you don't really get saved by keeping them, but you can get lost if you don't, in this case, this, the ordinances tend to draw you closer to uh, our Savior, our Messiah, and that'll, it, that will uh, strengthen your relationship and therefore your salvation. So, in, and this is not me saying it, as you can see right there, which now saves you, you see? So uh, that has become very important there. Uh, there's also the Lord's Supper. This is an annual memorial of Christ's death in which believers eat the bread and drink from the cup, symbols of his body and, and blood. So we're, we're coming up with, a, um, coming up with an, another Lord's Supper observance. And don't mistake that for the Passover, okay? The Passover was something entirely different, but it was pretty much about the same time. You know, without getting too much detail about it and getting sidetracked, I can say that the apostles were thinking that they were going to keep uh, the Passover with with, uh, with Yeshua, the, the Messiah, but it didn't quite happen. And they didn't understand what happened there, you know? He gave them the Lord's Supper. Is it replacing that? Uh, you know, I, I don't think I'm not. I, I don't think I wouldn't say that the Lord's Supper replaces the Passover. But what I'll say that Christ replaced the Passover because uh, in the Passover, as you know, the the blood was shed for sins and 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 uh, and marked on the doors. And the angel of God would not pass forward and kill anybody if they had that symbol there. But in the case of Yeshua or Jesus, he became the sacrifice. So, in, in fact, later on, Paul says, Paul the Apostle says, Jesus has become my Passover. See that? So there is some sort of relationship there that we cannot get away from, but there is no redemption without blood sacrifice. It happened in the very beginning. Uh, the very first sacrifice was um, uh, Adam and Eve, you know, when they sinned. And, uh, and a lot of people don't think of it that way, but it was. So you think about it, they were, they were worried that they were unclothed. They, they, they saw themselves as naked. So it was the Lord that had to kill an animal and cover them with a the fur. So that animal had to die for Adam and Eve's sin. Uh, I, I believe that he forgave them. You know, I do. Uh, but I, I wouldn't say the same thing uh, you know, for everybody that followed, because not everybody... Uh, uh, not everybody uh, kept it the way that they intended. It's a lot of uh, uh, blood shedding over the years, and, and and thank God that we don't have to do that. Do this? Do the Jews still do that? Well, no, they can't. I think Stan and I discussed it, and uh, they need to have that whole Temple Mount all ready to go before they can go in there and do that. Uh, there is a prophecy that I believe indicates that they will eventually get that fixed and they're going to attempt to sacrifice, you know, for their sins. 
Makes you wonder, though, uh, all those hundreds of years that that and no sacrifice was done for, in behalf of them. Did they do it at home? I, I don't think so. You know, it, at least that's my opinion. But the important thing, it's, it's a symbolic gesture. Jesus said, take this bread. It's broken for you. And he said, this is my body that is broken for you. And then he said, take this this uh this drink fruit of the vine he said because it is symbolizes my blood so all of that's symbolic you know but symbolism is a good thing it can actually be a, a blessing if you lend enough credence to it if you really believe that it makes a difference in your life and you are sincere about it after all isn't marriage a symbolic gesture you think a piece of paper is going to keep you together? You know, do you think a vow will keep you together? People break their vows all the time. It depends upon how much you meant for that. You know, what uh, what it really means to you. But we're living in a society that the world is just going that direction that nobody really keeps their uh, their promises anymore. There's another one that, um, another verse that I want to read that goes with that. It's in Luke 22, 19. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, This do this is my body, which is given for you, and do this in remembrance of me. And, and of course, he did the same thing for, for the, the drink, you know, that I forgot to indicate there. But it, it, uh, it's part of the, the next verse there. The other one is foot washing. is a sign of humility, and we wash each other's feet. You don't wash your own, you have somebody else do it, you know? And that person usually does it for you. This is done shortly after the Lord's Supper ceremony. And I got a couple, uh, some verses that need to go with that. And, and notice the significance of this ordinance, just like the Lord's Supper, just like baptism, it, it, it indicates something very important to the Lord. In John 13, beginning with verse 4, says, So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped, towel, wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. And let me stop there for a moment. It's in, I, I, every time I read that, and I usually read that, of course, when I'm conducting the the Lord's Supper observance. I'm thinking, isn't it odd that only Simon Peter thought I, there was a problem with that? And why did the other disciples not think so? I mean, they just sat there and it's okay, whatever. So I have to say that other disciples must have trusted the Lord enough to know that he knew what the, he was doing. And they were probably waiting to see if he could explain that to them. Simon Peter, becomes, because he was very fiery and tend to be very outspoken, he didn't quite go, get along with it, you know. So he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus said, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. That's really the indicate that that's the real feeling that I had about the other disciples. They also felt like I'll understand this later, you know. And I think we should all be that way because some things happen in our lives that we don't always know what it's about and what God means by that. And 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 when things like that happen in my life, I always say, I don't know what this is going to happen, but I'm sure the Lord will teach me about this later. And so it goes on to say. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. So he didn't just say, you will not wash my feet. He says, never wash my feet. And, and I don't think he was being disobedient, to be honest with you. I think he was just seeing, thinking, no, no, he's my, he's my Lord. He's my master. I, I don't want him humbling himself towards me. But Jesus then did explain it as he went on. So Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. And then Simon, as usual, overdoes everything, right? Says, he says, then Lord, Simon Peter replied, 
not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their, uh, their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him. Uh, and of course, that's Judas, as you realize. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. And when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. And so now he explains things to everybody else, which is what the disciples expected and what Peter should have at least trusted him that he would explain it. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them, you call me teacher and Lord. In the other, uh, other verses, uh, variations of the verse, it says Lord and Master. And rightly so, for what that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. And I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than the master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed. You see that? I'm going to give my little point here. Okay, uh, so he does say, you will be blessed. Now, who doesn't want need blessings? I sure do. I'm sure you do as well. So, no, it's, it's not going to uh, be a mandate, but it's more like telling you, if you, can, if you will do this, there will be a blessing from that. And so, when you and I do the Lord's Supper again, I uh, hope it would be nice if we had a building by that time, but who knows, you know, and if we don't, we'll just have to do it in our homes as we did before. But um, you will be blessed if you do it, you know, and I want that blessing. And I want you to think that at the end of all of that observances, that you have a new year that is going to be a blessing for you the rest of your year. And I think I'd like to start off my year the same way. And then there's the Ten Commandments. This is not an ordinance. This is a command, I guess I said before. This is not something you, you get a bonus if you do it. It's more like, these are my rules. As parents, don't we have house rules? First of all, you, you don't, you don't uh, talk back to me. You don't fight with me. You don't hit me. Because if you do, that is breaking a commandment, of course. So the Lord also has his rules. If you're going to be part of his family, these are the regulations. And if you don't do that, you are out of here. Basically what it says. Leviticus 22, 31, Therefore shall you keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord. Well, of course, everybody knew he's the Lord. But why did he say that? He puts a seal on it. Every time you hear the words, I am the Lord, it's like I have spoken. This is my command. This is me saying it, not anybody else. So if the Lord says that, you can't barter the thing. You can't barter with it. You cannot change it. You can only break it. Matthew 19, 17, the NIV version says, why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. If you keep enter if you want to enter into life keep the commandments see that if you're gonna if you want to be saved you need to be ke keeping the commandments and again i don't mean to say that you will be saved if you keep them and and that they are part of uh it, it is part of uh, your salvation because christ di died for our sins for that but what he is saying is that if you're gonna keep, stay in, in, in good with me, if you're gonna be a part of my family, if you're gonna be in part of my life and I'm part of your life, keep the commandments. Does everybody do that? No. And I'm not going to speculate as to whether anybody's gonna ever get it right. I, I don't know. And what's gonna happen to these people that have broken commandments? I don't know. I mean, I. I I, I, that's not something I stay up nights worrying about. 
but I hope they will get it right eventually. Exodus 20.10 talks about the Sabbath. Now, why am I dis uh, distinguishing the Sabbath? Because nobody else in other congregations and other churches has a problem with the other commandments. Uh, I, I, I had a, a discussion once with a, a young man who came up to me. He said, you guys keep the commandments? And I said, absolutely. And then he goes, those have been done away with. He said, really? I said, really? You don't think you have to keep the commandments? No, I don't have to keep them anymore. So you, you're going to go disrespect your parents? Well, I can't do that, of course. You're going to go kill somebody or steal from them or gossip about them? Not, no, that's not what I meant. And I, and I went on to tell them about the other things. But the point was, the problem he had was the Sabbath day. That's the problem that we, he was having. But he's not the only one. It's everybody. There's a lot of other people. Millions and millions of people do not observe the Sabbath. Therefore, we, I have to make a distinction here as part of the doctrine. Exodus 20.10. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do no, you shall not do any work. Neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. Oh, he's covering everybody. Even, even the critters are going to be a day of rest, you know? And not, and not only the, them, but also people that are, uh, that, are, that are not part of your family, but they're part of your life. And maybe they're in your household. If you're gonna if you're gonna be in my house, you're gonna be keeping the Sabbath, you know. But let us get more into this because these are verses that I think you should use in case somebody challenges your concept of keeping the Lord's day. Hebrews 4, 4 to 9 says, For he who has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day, you see that he's very specific about saying the seventh day. Not, not anybody, not anything else. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. You cannot do that. You know, it's kind of like saying, I know your birthday is on, uh, uh, in my case, I'll throw my on there, uh, August the 15th. But you'll say, but we're going to celebrate on another day. Well, you can't change the day I was born, nor can you change it. There are some days that are hard, uh, that are that are hard in the sense that you cannot challenge them or convey them. I mean, because the Lord says the seventh day, and again in this place they shall enter, not enter into my rest. It sounds like it's contradicting it, right? But he's he's uh, complaining about some people that don't want to do it. They don't want to enter my rest. They want to enter into their rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter in, and that's you and I, and those to whom it was first preached, those are the Jews, did not enter because of disobedience. What is he say? What, and I was thinking, when I read, read that again, I thought, well, what was he talking about? They didn't, did not enter because of disobedience. Maybe he's alluding to the story of remember the manna that was out there and he that was out in, in the fields and they were told not to collect it uh, any other day other than maybe Sunday through uh, Friday. But on Friday or the day before the Sabbath, they would actually uh, collect an extra amount so they don't have to pick any and uh, look for any on the Sabbath day. They still did it anyway, didn't they? They do. And, and uh, I had a discussion with um, uh, a professor uh, in, in my uh, theology classes, and he said, and, and I told him about that. He said, do you think it's only talking about uh, the manna and all of that? No, they're still doing it today. And I said, well, what do you, how, in what way? And he said, well, they they've already figured out that if you in, if you eat at home, then that's you do that because it's your home. Therefore, anywhere you eat your food is your home. Okay, 
so that what they wind up doing to undermine undermine the the Lord's uh, Sabbath, and we're talking about these these very Orthodox Jews, they would place a piece of have somebody place a meal for them every so many miles. You see, and I I couldn't believe when he's telling me this. He says so so they would start traveling where they wanted to go. And they would take a nibble after, after so many miles and move on and take another nibble and on and on until they got to another place. But you see what they were doing is they were traveling. And that was part of the work that they were doing that day. I don't know what they were up to. But the point is the Lord is telling them they were disobedient. And but then he goes on to say that he very specific about what day of rest he's talking about. He designates a certain day and that's what he's talking about designating a day and you cannot change that he designates a day you and i don't get to designate any day it is the lord that does that saying in david today after such a long time has been said today if you hear his voice do not harden your hearts for if joshua had given them rest then he would not afterward have spoken of another day there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. It doesn't say for the Jews or, or the new converts or whatever. He says for all the people of God. That's what he's talking about. So this has become not just a commandment, but an ordinance. Because, and the reason that I say that is because there is a special blessing set aside for those who keep the Sabbath. You see? We are entering to the rest of the Lord and we are in, in sync with him. And that makes that day even more special. But it it's also becomes more of a problem if you violate it. There is a penalty for that. Exodus 31.15 says, Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh day the Sabbath rest, uh, Sabbath of rest holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, what does it say right there? Shall be surely put to death. Of course, now we're not, we're not going to be hunting down Sunday keepers and go executing them, of course. But uh, back then, they were stoned to death. You see? But nowadays, we will say this. They will suffer death, the eternal death, in the, in the next life. You see? And, and those are the people that God is talking to. So this is the one, this is the one particular commandment where uh, it is specified that if you don't keep it, you will be put to death. So observing the Sabbath was an important sign of, of covenant between God and his people. And failure to observe this critical symbol of the covenant was such a serious breach of the relationship that it was assigned, that it was a penalty of death. Up to this point, Israel had a proven track record of either forgetting or disobeying God's commands. In the people's excitement to begin constructing the new tabernacle, it was imperative that they worship, uh, not be, be overlooked, even to be uh, to do praiseworthy work. So even if you're doing a lot of great stuff, you know, uh, yeah, the Lord wasn't good with that. Thus, the death penalty emphasized the seriousness of maintaining fidelity to the solemn pledge between the people and God. And that's why we're, we're here today, you know. And some of us don't always keep it the same, you know. Uh, and, and I think I, 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 will, I will actually tell you that, that I've been at fault about that in the past uh, in the way that uh, when I first started keeping the Sabbath, uh, I used to go out with people and have a meal together, buy a meal. You know, we, we used to go to Luby's and do all kinds of good things, you know, and it seemed like it was okay because the people that knew more than I did were doing it, so I thought it was okay. But you know what? If you were going to go into detail more about this going back to Exodus, it even tells you that you should not be buying or selling. And I thought, uh oh, well, now that I know, I can't do that. So once the Lord uh, shows you the truth, you, you're, you're going to be more liable than ever before if you don't uh, 
if you don't keep it. Oops. Then there's tithing. This is another ordinance. Keep getting pop up windows on my screen. It gets me up. It's getting me mad now. Proverbs 3 9 to 10. Honor Adonai with your wealth and with the first fruits of your increase, your income. Now, for some reason, when tithing is spoken of, they leave first fruits out. What, and that is a very important word. You know what that means to me? Give the Lord first the things that pertain to him. Don't give him leftovers. If you invited uh, somebody to, to eat at your home, would you give them leftovers or would you make a meal for them? You know, why does the Lord have to get uh, be second best? And there's a lot of people that don't even tithe. And if they tithe, they don't want to tithe everything. But I can tell you that if you trust the Lord enough, he will provide more if you if you uh, keep this uh, particular ordinance. And he says, then your granaries will be filled and your vats overflow with wine. Well, I don't have any wine in my home and I don't have any granaries, but I do have uh, the need to have money in my, in my bank, right? And so the Lord provides far more for us, I can tell you, and I think Martha can concur, that then uh, we give out a lot more, you know. And I'm, I'm happy to give even more if I have to, you know. Uh, even if it means just purchasing things, you know, for, for the, the cause. But he also makes it, again, this ordinance very important. Malachi 3.8 says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, but you say, wherein have I we robbed you? In th tithes and offerings. I think it's a pretty important thing, right? You, you might be feeling, well, I don't have to listen to that pastor. He just wants my money. But you got, if you give it, even if that guy uses it the wrong way, at least you can say, that you gave it to God and the Lord will take it that way and he will deal that with the other guy later and I, I I dare say that in the past I think that some of the money I we've given away was used incorrectly but that's water under the bridge and that's something that the Lord can ask that person tell that person are you robbing me so but that's up to God you know Now let's get into the sanctity of marriage here. This is going to open up a can of worms, as you probably know, because we're living in a society today where marriage has been violated over and over again, because not only do people not keep the marriage holy and sacred, but they're mixing it up in the ways that God never intended. So we need to define it correctly in Genesis 1. 27 to 28 says, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he, he, him. Male and female created he, them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So, very clearly, man and woman getting married. Why he's getting in the married? Because that's the way they multiply. If two, two guys got married, that's not going to happen. If two women got married, that will never happen. So God has instituted the marriage between a male and female. But it really doesn't always work out that way today. 29 states have constitutions that include bans on same-sex marriage and or types of unions and have 31 statutes that ban same-sex marriage and or other types of unions, although these are all defunct under the Obergell Fell ruling that I don't know anything about. But if that's says 29, uh, states that, that ban it, and, and, and I'm, I'm glad to say that Texas is one of them, and you can imagine um, California is not. 
and other nations, uh, states like that. But here's another problem. In November 2020, Nevada became the first state to repeal its constitution ban on same-sex marriage following Obergefell. Bell. So they're saying, we're going to do this anyway. It's going to repeal this constitutional ban on same-sex marriage. You know, in other words, we're all for it. That's okay. As of 2015, same-sex marriage is now federally legal in all 50 states. So in other words, the government is overruling the states. Due to a ruling from the Supreme Court, however, in the aftermath of Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization ruling, and uh, I, I forgot to include the rest, but what they were simply saying, however, what they're saying is states still have a right to say, no, I'm not going to do it. So it's kind of like uh, undermining themselves. One says you can't do it. The other says I, I can if I want to or, or I won't if I, if I don't feel like it or whatever. So there's a lot of confusion about that. And uh, because of the fact that it's been, that it's been uh, pushed greatly from, by different groups. Now, there are new pronouns. This is, I'm, I'm just going to pick on, on, on the women about this, you know? And not because I'm picking on women, but because if I gave you the ones for men, it would be a lot longer and we'd be wasting our time. And in fact, I'm not even going to read all of these, but they want new pronouns for women. They don't necessarily look at themselves as women. Okay? So, if it's a she, you may have to call that person a he. Okay, or a Z, or an XE, or a SIE, or they. They meaning that, like you're talking about these women that are not considering themselves women anymore, maybe they want to be considered themselves as something else. Then they say, if you're referring to them, they don't want you to say those ladies, they want you to say they, okay, or them. And if you're talking about something possessive, it's their or theirs or themselves. It seems to me like that is probably the less argumentative uh, pronoun that you can that you can use, right? But but as you can see, all these other things, where do they come up with these things? You know, like a her. I look at the last one here, and I'm not going to go through all of those because they don't make any kind of sense. Uh, herself. If, if you want to say herself, now if that person is homosexual or lesbian, you got to call him himself or zerself or exerself or her hir self. Sounds to me like it's herself again and so forth. And uh, in fact, I'm getting to uh, see that more and more on the internet, and you probably have too. Uh, I'm even getting from the, from the, um, I got that from the VA the other day, you know, because I do a lot of, um, uh, I mean, I, a lot of my medical treatments come from the Veterans Administration because of my military duty. And uh, the other day they, they sent me a message and they said, what, prefer he says, uh, uh, Joe Corrales, it said, what pronoun would you prefer we call you? I said, uh, my sex hasn't changed. I'm still a guy. I'm still a him, you know. Oh, yeah, that's all we need to know. That's fine. And, uh, but the, the, they're asking everybody. I wonder what they're saying. In fact, in some of the websites that I get into, they, always, they already say, uh, do you prefer to call, uh, what do you prefer to call yourself? Or are you a he or a she? Or non-binary is another term they're throwing on there. Uh, this is the world we're living in, okay? But I, I don't, I, you know, maybe I'm stubborn, you know, but I, I refuse to go along with that. If somebody says, call, uh, uh, call me a he, I'll say, uh, no, I'm not going to bother with that. It's, it's your problem. If you want to do, if you want to think that way, it's on you, but don't drag me into this, you know, because I, I you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to go along with that. 
To be honest with you, there are some people that are so changed in their appearance that I really won't know what they are, you know? Romans 1, beginning with 26, says, Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. This is what God thinks about this. Even the women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. And in the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves a due penalty for their error. What, what due penalty can you think about? Well, the loss of their salvation is one of them. But if you were to give it, give it more of a, uh, of a, a current context, there's also AIDS involved in that, isn't there? But th this is this is not okay with the Lord. It's just not okay. Uh, I remember the Obama administration was threatening to uh, close down churches that did not perform marriages between same-sex couples. Uh, they never kind of pushed it. It was a big backlash on there, and and uh, I haven't heard of it again, but. They, they, I think that going back with what Stan was talking about, people kind of watching what you're doing and kind of being overseeing things and kind of censoring you. I wouldn't be surprised now that that we now that we post these videos up online for others, that some people are going to be thinking that uh, we need to censor these guys as well. We need to go check them out, you know. Uh, they're doing that already everywhere. For example, uh, when, when I'm teaching, now and then a, uh, an adult that I don't know and will not introduce themselves or nothing, they'll come and sit in my classroom and they start writing notes. And what they're doing is, obviously from, my, from what I heard later on, they're checking on us if they see they agree with what, what we're doing, how we're conducting our classes and and so forth and so on. Uh, so they're kind of censoring things, you know. Uh, how serious is that? Well, I know that one person was fired because of the, the note taking that they took on there. But I, I'm just going to be myself. I, I think if I get in trouble, it's probably because, because I'm probably going to be missing the Lord or something. You know, they, they may not like that, you know. And, and I, I don't, I'm not preaching to people, you know, but um, if, if the Lord figures into the situation, then so be it, you know. Let's talk about Christian living because this is part of the doctrines of the Church of God. Hebrews 12, 14 says, follow peace with all men in holiness without which man shall not see the Lord. Without which no man shall see the Lord. So following, trying to get along with people, you know, uh, I, getting back to what I was talking to with Sister Esther, uh, I, don't, I don't think that we should give place to liberalism everywhere it is and people that, are don't, uh, that, that don't like Christians and so forth. And so, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to go fight at with them or argue with them, you know. Uh, uh, I'm going to try to live in peace with them. You know, I'm not going to agree with them. And I'm not going to go along with them. And I'm not going to peace to them. But I'm going to just say, well, that's your opinion, whatever, you know. And, and, and I move on. You know, I'm not there to change people if they don't want to change. So I do my best to get along with everybody. Okay. I, I'm not in your face about my faith and so forth. And I don't think anybody, any of us should be. Uh, probably the only time that's going to happen is when you get, I get confronted, but you know, that's, that doesn't happen very often. Also Leviticus 11, 45, 47, for I am the Lord that brings you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy for I am holy. This is the law of, of every living creature that moves on the waters and of every creature that creeps upon the earth to make a difference between unclean and clean and between the beasts that may be eaten and the beasts that may not be eaten. So that's another one that I have to throw in there because surprisingly, you know, they, they 
the Church of God still is pushing for clean and unclean, you know. But it's to me, it's more about the holiness about it. And here's what I think about this. I don't think this is a, an ordinance that loses your salvation either. Uh, and I had plenty of discussion with other pastors about it. Uh, we have de determined that a lot of people that eat pork, for example, have gotten trichinosis. So I think that when, when the Lord talked about this before uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to Israel, when they were in the wilderness, they wouldn't eat anything they could, I guess, because they were so hungry. They just don't eat this and do, don't eat that. But he was more concerned about what makes it unclean, by the way. It's not healthy for you. That's what it means. Uh, one brother said to me, well, I don't uh, I, I don't keep the, the laws of unclean and unclean. And I, and, I, and I said, he says, and I don't think that's going to kill me, but it's going to shorten my life probably, but I'm okay with it. If you want to shorten your, uh, your life, that's on you. And, uh, and then in the New Testament, it does mention, do not judge your brother for whatever he eats or doesn't eat, you know, uh, because it's not going to defile him. Uh, except, it, but what, only the things that proceeds out of his mouth will defile him, not, not the things that he's taking in. So this particular one has become a little, this ordinance has become a little bit weaker. But uh, with, with that said, I still keep that. And, and my family still keeps it, you know. Uh, but it's a matter of choice that I would say. Uh, I have not read anything yet that, that, that is condemning if you don't keep this law. Uh, and, and far be it for me to condemn anybody that doesn't either, you know, it's on them. Uh, if, they, if they want to take a chance that it's not uh, healthy for them, well, who am I to say? It's like, uh, I, don't, I, I don't believe that some people should not do certain things that is probably going to be un, uh, health, unhealthy for them, but it, it, it's on them. It's the way I, I call it, you know. The more important thing is to be holy unto the Lord. Christians are called to holiness in thought, word, and deed, and to express faith in Christ through devotion to God and godly interaction with others. As a result, not a cause of redemption, believers should develop a relationship with God through Bible reading and study prayer for fasting, worship, and obedience and we haven't been fasting you know in our church i think we we need to do that set aside one day for that maybe that's what the lord requires of us to give us a place of our own i don't know that's something noble worthy of um uh of fasting for but also part of what the another ordinance is about relieve the physical and spiritual needs of humanity by compassion social actions and gospel witness. If you can help your brother or your neighbor, by all means, you should do that as well. But oppose pride, envy, and indolence, lust, covetous, covetousness, and other evils in the spirit. Here, uh, these are not my words, by the way. Uh, these are part of the, the COG7 ordinances as well. It's all part of the Christian living. And also refuse immoral amusements and practice such as pornography, sexual immorality, and homosexuality in the flesh. We've already covered that. Observe these Bible principles. Give tithe and free will offerings for the support of the church and its gospel ministry. And eat for food only those meats that the Bible describes as clean. These are all included in there. Okay, but it's an ordinance. Uh, ordinance is not a salvation issue, but it's better if you do this ordinance than it is if you don't, okay? It doesn't really affect you uh, in, in a negative way, but it's a positive thing. And I think that's it's a good thing for us to clean, eat the better, uh, the clean food for healthy purposes, okay? But if you, if you, you know, if you don't if, if you don't care about your health then that's on you or if you um, have determined that something is un unclean for you it's between you and the lord as, as far as i can say but regard and participation in physical warfare 
as contrary to Christians' humanitarian calling. Here again, I'm going to have to um, uh, make a distinction here, okay? And, but I'll read it, and then I will explain what my position is about that. Avoid intermixing Christianity with extra biblical practices, as in the common observances of Sunday, Christmas, Easter, Lent, and Halloween. They still do it anyway. A lot of churches still do that, you know. They do Christmas, they do Easter, Lent, and Halloween, you know. They make it a Christian Halloween and all kinds of things. But let me go back to this part about the physical warfare because, you know, and uh, I don't want to call attention to myself, but I, but, but I, uh, the reason that I believe this uh, or, or do not uh, say that I'm 100% okay with it, is because Israel went to war, didn't they? They defended their homeland. Should we not do the same if that happens to our country? Uh, I, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but my position, I, I feel like I'm a Nazarite by, by choice, in the sense that I'm very careful about what I eat, uh, I don't, I never drink alcohol, uh, I never take um, street drugs or anything like that, you know. I've devoted myself to the ministry, and therefore, I don't feel that I personally should go to war. But, on the other hand, I believe in supporting the brethren that do, okay? Which sounds like is an opposition, isn't it? And that's why I was a combat medic, you know. I felt like I should help, but... I knew that I was helping people that were shooting other people, but they were, you know, doing this for their country, you know. And and so the church was very adamant and against uh, military service. Although a lot, I know a lot of ministers that are former military people as myself, you know. If I had, a, in, in fact, I was actually asked by the superintendent recently. He says, Joe, I knew you went to the military. If you had to do it again, would you still do that? I said, absolutely not. <laughs> In a heartbeat, I would do it again. Okay, but you know, the church doesn't go with that. Yeah, yeah, I know, but you know, I don't agree with everything either that they're doing today and before. But that's the reason I believe that, because we need to defend our country. We need to support those that do. Okay, so in that in that regard, I support the, the police uh, as well, and uh, I support uh, all the other people that are defending and taking care of us. There are medical people that are, including a, 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 a niece of mine, including my, my uh, a sister who passed away. They were nurses and taking care of people. Is that a bad thing? Well, think about if all the nurses walked out, what would happen for that day? Some people would die. So even Jesus would say, if your ox fell in a ditch, would you not take it out of the ditch just because it's the Sabbath? So you got to use some common sense with that, I think, when you talk about Christian living in the things that you do on the Sabbath. Let's talk a little bit about prophecy because that's mentioned also. In, uh, in regarding um, the church doctrine. John 5.39 says, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me. So Yeshua or Jesus was telling uh, the people, you, you believe all everything about prophecy. But these are pointing to, my, to me. He was a Messiah. In fact, there was a mathematician that came up with this, and I wish I ever wrote this, wrote this down. I thought I would remember it, but I forgot. But he said it was over thousands and thousands of, of uh, the, the chance, he says, of him, Yeshua, actually fulfilling all the prophecy was, it was like a, a miracle. It was like thousands and thousands of possibilities that it would not work out, that it wouldn't fail. But he complied with every one of those prophecies. So if you're looking for somebody else, he's not coming. He's already been here and he will be here again. And so that's the reason that he mentioned that. But he goes on regarding prophecy, though, that I think is essential. In Luke 16, 16, until John the Baptist, the law of Moses and the messages of the prophets were your guides. 
But now the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone is eager, eager to get in. So the primary difference between men like Jeremiah, a true prophet of God and false prophets was their source of information. Do we have prophets today? No, no more prophets. Uh, although there are churches that believe in prophets. They believe they have prophets in their in their congregation. There are no prophets because God says there's no prophets and that's what we believe. Rather than speak the word of the Lord, false prophets deliver messages that originated in their own hearts and minds. So this is what the Lord says. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. And this is coming out of Jeremiah 23 and Ezekiel 13. It's very lengthy, so I took kind of a paraphrase it there. God distances himself from false prophets. I did not send these prophets, yet they have run with their message. I did not speak to them, yet they have prophesied. That comes from verse 21 of uh, 23rd chapter of Jeremiah. Getting ready to wrap it up for today. It's been a little, a little bit lengthy, you know, and this is the reason why I was telling you I just could not shorten this thing as much as I could because it's like it's, I felt like it, I'd be remiss if I if I did not elaborate more on the, the doctrines of the Lord. So which part of these doctrines we talked about so far are a problem for people? They're meant for good things. And, and if you're obedient to the Lord, you have to comply with them. So next week, I will talk about the kingdom of God. Because there's different ones, you know, in, in for example, the present kingdom, the spiritual kingdom, the millennial kingdom of Christ. And those are the kingdoms that we will be talking about in, in, the, in the week to come. Because this is part of the doctrines that we need to realize. Are you part of God's kingdom or not? If you're God, going out and doing your own thing, then you are not in the right kingdom. You are in the kingdom of the enemy, I would say. So I'm going to uh, get out of this for now. And discard. Okay, so that will conclude for today. Uh, I guess we never got the Heinz of Skabah board there, but I wonder if uh, you have any music stand that you want to close with? Yeah, I do. Uh, do you want to do a closing prayer first? Yes, let, let, and at least I knew whether to expect it or not. Okay, let's go ahead and pray then. Thank you, Lord, for this message you've given us. We know it's, it's not your servant's message. It is your message. For I yield to you, Lord, in everything. I yield to your doctrine. I yield to your ordinances as best that I can because I know that they're meant to do good in my life, in the lives of your people. And not everybody keeps your doctrines, Lord. We know that. But we will not follow after them, but we will try to lead by example. But more importantly, we will do so to comply with those demands you have put upon, placed upon your people. And so we thank you for your coming kingdom and your kingdom that we are part of today and ask that you continue with us the rest of our day of rest, that you empower us with a generous portion of your Holy Spirit, that you will cleanse us from evil and bad thoughts and nourish us with your word and nourish us with your Holy Spirit as well. Fill us with your presence, Lord, as you cover us with grace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.